As I mentioned, the, the crown is an advanced topic. It seems very simple to do, and when you get good at this, it is pretty easy to do. Um, but starting out, there are a lot of complexities, and the complexities lie on the front end before surgery. That's picking a candidate that's going to be safe because that area is going to continue to recede. And also the design has to look aesthetically uh, pleasing. And these two components can be very difficult to master. So, you know, how do you explain something that they don't look at, right? Well, you have to present all sides of the picture to them. And what that means is that not only is that obvious baldness sitting on the backside, but from the front, the upper arc of the crown can also be visualized in the sense that those hairs contribute to the density from the front view. And another component, component that you may not think about is from the lateral view, someone that's balding starts to flatten and it makes them look balder. So when you recreate that roundness, it really helps them look more youthful. And when the angles are higher now, remember we talked about low for the front, my contention is the crown should be higher. You can hear different people tell, tell you different things, and that's fine. Just the way that I do it is not gospel. This is the way I do it because it works for me, and you're gonna find what works for you. So all I can do is present to you what works for me. But I contend that the angle should be higher in the back for a lot of reasons, which we'll discuss in a moment, and that one of which is to contribute to the roundness and that volume lift that's not present. So who is a candidate? Well, again, when you start out, you need rules, okay? Rules that will keep you safe. One rule is don't do this for the first few years in your practice. I'm gonna help divide. The, so Vance was talking about A's and B's of important and not important. I'm gonna divide in A's and B's, which are safe and not safe, okay? So that's a different A and B category. This is a B for the starting um, point. It's 35 years plus. Is that a hard fix rule? Of course it's not. I've operated in someone in their late 20s, early 30s, but that's because I've done this long enough where I know how much donor supply, how much counseling I've gone with a patient, how big the crown is. A lot of factors go into this, but for you guys, if you're gonna start doing crowns in hopefully a few years, when you start getting into this, look for an older patient who has, because once I like this magical 40 year old bracket, because it's not magic, but I find that categorically when men are over 40, their hair loss progression, in most cases, not always, slows down and becomes more stable in nature and more predictable. So 35 plus would be a nice minimum category for you guys. And I also like to say that if they're interested in the crown but their whole front is gone, you may want to, to help them see how important the framing element of the front is before they go back and jump to the back of the scalp. So this is something that I always say can help them guide someone and say, you know what, maybe your front is more important. It's first of all, potentially easier, safer um, than going to the crown and before you go to the backside. And also look at helping someone stabilize a miniaturized condition. In other words, if they're rapidly thinning, they're probably better on medicine or at least consider medicine as an adjunctive measure to help them. And the other element of that, that you, whoever was in my um, station for the donor harvesting, remember we spent about 30 minutes going through analysis of the donor hair, of what, how much donor density, what was the caliber, what is safe, is there retrograde loss, is there, remember we, I showed you those cornet patterns that were diving down where you thought, oh, this is safe, and it's not, it's unstable hair. So how much donor capacity is available, what, how much baldness is present, how, how much can I cover this today and predicting what is gonna be the problem in five to 10 years from now, all that esoterica, you have to piece these little p pieces together and go, is this safe, is this not safe? Because these categories are a little bit vague and these categories are a little bit also somewhat clear. And so I wanna help you define those things and also to understand that an education, as I explained in the last lecture, is so important. Because if the patient doesn't expect that, hey, I'm, I may need another procedure, I'm gonna have further progression, um, then that's gonna be a problem. And also, I find that the crown doesn't have as good a take as the front. So sometimes you go, oh, that's an easy crown, I'm gonna nail this. And all of a sudden you do it and you go, how come I still see through this? And there are reasons, which we'll explain in this lecture, that you have to set up expectations. Anytime I deal with the crown, I tell the patient, you may need two sessions. I say that for any case I do, in fact. Because if I say that, then they're gonna say, oh, he, he, I thought he was gonna do in one session, give me a miracle. Well, anytime you can give an education rather than an excuse, you're better off. Okay, so keep that in mind. Different crown patterns that exist out there. This is more 
just a fun fact. I don't think it really is going to define how you create a pattern, but I think it's nice to know that the S pattern primarily is the, is the most common one. This is a, a Zeering's um, work that he's looked at all this, and, and sometimes you see a higher pre predilection toward a diffuse pattern in women. I don't do a lot of female isolated crowns because it doesn't exist that commonly. Um, then the crown hair loss patterns, I told you you saw that coronet pattern, look for it because oftentimes it's underneath that area or when you wet the hair you start seeing, oh my god, that little crown that was like this is that big. And then what happens is you design, you plan on this to go that big and when they wet their hair they got a patch sitting there in this big wet zone that looks crappy. So wet the hair if, in, in the console if that helps you because you may not be able to see the miniaturization well and it's a trick to keep yourself safe so when you design this it looks good and then look in, 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 and so look for the extent of, of the disease which means involving miniaturization which sometimes cannot be as readily evident to someone just starting out until that hair gets wet and then you see a little bit better so uh, Beaner came up with this I believe I don't want to give the wrong attribution but the idea of the billboard effect and what this is simply Simply put is remember in those lectures where I talked about the, the, the box of the, the head and to take a round head and make it into a, a box so the crown is on the vertical plane of that box on the back side so therefore when you're looking at the crown you're looking at it on a vertical plane so you're looking at bald scalp when I'm looking at the top of the head where I'm making hairlines I'm not seeing the scalp I'm seeing all the hair so what is the definition of baldness seeing scalp if you see a scalp obliquely and hairs are all aligned, you can get more visual density. When the, when the crown is on the vertical plane and you're looking at it straight on like a billboard, then the baldness is more evident and harder to camouflage. In addition to that, because the, the crown is in a whirl and a, a constant swirl pattern, they don't interlock as well. And so they're splayed open like a book. So you have more visual loss or more more difficulty in camouflaging it. So the angulation is so important to make that camouflage look better and again we're going to get there in a few minutes here. So planning the donor area as I, remember, as, as I said look at this pattern there is that coronet there's that little bit of coronet going down so we can't take that hair. So we got to take a, for me big crowns take a lot of hair it eats up a lot of hair and there and there's a lot of ways to plan this. The way I'm going to tell you maybe counter uh, counter to some of my faculty and that's fine. There's so many ways to do this and this is just the way that I do and it's worked for me. So the initial plan may be okay that's the area but then you may say wait a second I'm starting to see some thinness there and then you got to figure out what if if they're an older patient maybe that's acceptable. A younger patient actually counterintuitively may need more because they're going to recede into that surrounding zone where you're going to be worried about it. And you heard already in the last lecture the female crown sort of to me looks like a dumbbell design. It just means that there is an extension in the backside and is rarely an isolated crown in a woman. So I like to create regions and you heard all the sub-regions of the scalp already, lateral hump, temporal point, uh, mid scalp, etc. I like to mentally divide the crown into sub regions. The reason I like to do that, it helps to me plan architecturally how I'm going to restore the, the crown. So the central world is where I start. I recommend for you to start with a world. We'll do a, a little sa sample uh, show up there because I believe, even though this may seem like a waste of time, when you watch someone operate, you see them move their hands you start to memorize that hand movement and it starts to enter your subconscious and I really think it's important that's why I asked my faculty in the lab before you just throw them to start doing things let them watch you move and let them watch you move for five or ten minutes then watch them that is much more instructive than just going out and start making sites because you don't know what you're doing you need to have that basis. So start with the central world. The upper arc to me is very important for a few reasons. One, visually it goes up to cover, remember I told you that from the frontal view, the visual density, the, the back of the crown actually helps your front because it comes up this way. It also arcs over and down over to the lower arc. And then the vertex transition point is what Vance called the, uh, the hairline in the back. Okay, remember that's a transition from the hair, from the horizontal to the vertical. It's going to the posterior mid scalp when it goes anterior to that. And that's the area where it's the movie theater area. Remember, that's if, if that's the end of your reconstruction, this would be the end of it going forward for the crown. And if you do, were doing the front, it would probably be the end of your, of your transplant before you hit the crown. You would have to create that posterior hairline. 
Um, the lower arc is not as important, but it's still important. And if you underserve that lower arc in service of the upper arc, you're going to see a hole there. You have to be, these are just relative uh, um, comments. So transitions. Remember what I said is that the transitions are all gentle and subtle. There are no abrupt shifts. So let's show that in a, in a couple slides here. So here's the central whorl and the outer hair that's transitioning. Well, they can't be abrupt. So if you look, when you make that pattern, it's got to join in a way that has this transition. It gradually goes from this clockwise whorl and joins the outer fringe. Remember, what I, remember when we saw the, the gentleman on how hair grows? When you go up to the back of that lateral hump, it doesn't just all of a sudden go like this and then go like that. It goes over like this. The posterior mid scalp goes forward like this. So these gentle transitions, if it's not clear, have one of the faculty work with you and show us a non-balding scalp to understand that concept. So what is my preferred design? Now, what, am I, what do I mean by preferred design? What I mean is if the person is so bald that there's no existing worlds that I have to follow and I have full carte blanche to create what I want, this is what I usually typically do and for a few enumerated reasons. So that my preferred design is a clockwise left base world. Why? Well, this is my rationale. It may not work for you. It may not work for every person. This is just creating a blueprint of, of basics that may help you in your design work. So here is the hair part and the comb direction. So again, it covers the hair part from the front and it creates a combable, right? If you comb left to right, your, your crown now follows that arc. So it helps. So I then prioritize densities. So when I'm looking at this, remember these are paint brushes. I'm looking at this is a very important area because it covers the hair part, it covers the top, and it arcs over, okay? And then it, and then it progressively becomes less important as it goes down. So these are just ideas. This is not to tell you, please try to memorize these priorities. No, but it, it allows you to understand how hair transplant, even in the crown, can be fun, can be intellectually stimulating, can be creative in nature. And if I can stimulate you to see how hair can be fun and intellectually interesting, then you're going to say, well, I'm going to start coming up with my own vocabulary, what's important uh, in terms of design. And then sometimes I'll put these patterns of hair. So these are follicular units. So for example, two hair follicular units, maybe in the center to make it look natural, then more threes and fours. And I, I will design according to that pattern there. And then I'll just use needles to, to make my sights. And sometimes I'll use blades, um, but it doesn't really matter. These are, again, these are B-type problems. So, and then this is just showing you some patterns as a counterclockwise right-sided whorl. This is a clockwise left-sided whorl, okay? And then this is what, remember you saw this slide uh, yesterday, it's transitioning up high and then transitioning low because not only are there gradual transitions going this way, but on the angles there's gradual transitions going back. And why? So this is the slide I, I mentioned to you. I want you to understand the why. Without understanding the why, you can't do the what. So the reason I like to have my graphs in the crown higher arced but remember the front is lower, is that it gives me three advantages. One, it gives me the round profile. It gives me more lift. It also allows me to pack it in. Because think of this, when I make a round circle and it's splayed underneath, how much underground surface am I covering? And now I'm trying to compete for that space. But if I tilt these graphs up, then they compete for very little sub subcutaneous plane, right? And I can pack that whorl really tight. And also, when these go up, they lift and they fall. So they create more visual density when they're packed together this way. Well, the opposite is true for the front of the scalp when they don't whirl. When you can lay them down this way, they create a better shingle. They're talking about the hairline. This is better in the hairline. This is better in the crown, okay? So it's almost the opposite. That's why when I'm doing this, I'm having the person sit up to do it because I get a, a better uh, result by making the crown with the angles going up. I'm going to skip this case study because it's too long-winded. Uh, and we'll just show you a few before and afters. Clockwise whirl, okay? This is showing the rounding improvement. This is showing you a correction from a slot deformity from what's called a scalp reduction. This is just unusual shape, person on Propecia. There's a little bit of loss, in the, and then you just build around it. This is a diffuse pattern on a woman. 
This is just using finer graphs. Even though it's not perfect coverage, it creates an overall uh, illusion of improvement. I like to show the fact that sometimes when most of the crown is all the upper arc all aiming up, it's almost like a hairline. There's not as much splaying, so you can get more, you can get a better result. It's more visually dense. Does that make sense? This is using uh, a, uh, the robot to do a plug correction over here. And this is just using, using some PRP and A-cell to, to improve the crown. So the point of this lecture, and we're going to do a short demo, was really to, to not teach you how to do a crown step by step, but to teach you the creative elements that can be involved with anything. And you're going to create your own.